Today we'll be discussing deviance. So before we start today's lecture, I want you to think to yourself, what qualifies as a deviance? What qualifies as an act of deviance? And so as you're pondering what deviant means, what deviance means, let's start to identify and define the meaning of norms within our society. I want you to think about social life being governed by norms that in many ways help define the types of behavior, the kinds of behavior that are considered appropriate within a particular context, within a particular culture, within a particular society, and what types of behaviors are considered inappropriate within these similar settings. In many ways, when we talk about norms, we're essentially talking about the principles, the roles that serve as a guideline that people are expected to observe in their everyday social lives. Essentially, these are the do's and the don'ts of society. Norms prescribe a given type of behavior that is considered acceptable and those behaviors that are considered forbidden. I want you to go back to your elementary, middle school, and high school years. The idea that an inappropriate behavior within the classroom was typically if you had to use the bathroom. You couldn't just get up and go. You had to raise your hand and ask permission. At times you were handed a hall pass or a bathroom pass. That was considered the norm. That was considered appropriate behavior within your classroom setting at those particular levels of education. But at the same time, when we look at a college environment, it would actually be considered abnormal behavior to raise your hand and ask your professor for permission to use the bathroom. And I find it always entertaining and that's how I know who's freshly out of high school. Because a lot of times when I'm lecturing in the fall semester, I'll have students raise their hand and they'll say, can I use the bathroom? I'm like, yeah, you don't have to ask permission to do so. And so it's just an interesting uh, observation that I make and that other professors that I've conversed with have made when we're, when we're able to easily identify who's fresh out of high school and, uh, you know, who's been in the, high, in the college environment for some time. But think about that. Appropriate and appropriate behavior, the do's and don'ts of a social setting. So now that you've started to think about what qualifies as a deviance, what qualifies as an act of deviance, let's define what deviance is. Deviance is essentially a behavior, a trait or belief that departs from a norm and that generates a negative reaction within a particular social setting, within a particular group. That's incredibly important to understand. The negative reaction that is generated by participating in a particular behavior that is considered abnormal. When we talk about what is normal, when we talk about what is abnormal within our society, remember, it's relative to the standards that have been established within that society, that have been established within that culture. So what is normal to me? may be abnormal to you, and vice versa. According to Good, norms and group reactions are necessary for a behavior or a characteristic to be defined as deviance. So what exactly does that mean? Well, essentially what Good is arguing is that an act is not deviance until society, until a culture, until a group labels it as such. So if I want to 
drink and drive. Until society frowned upon drinking and driving, it was not viewed as a deviant act. If I want to um, walk across the streets on a busy street, well, that wasn't considered a deviant act until society told us it was. And so you always need a significant other. You always need a generalized other to provide that counter narrative, to provide that interpretation of your activities as negative, as abnormal. And so I want you to start to think about that. Because at times, there can be this struggle between what is normal, what is abnormal, what is deviant, and what is not deviant. So I want you to start to picture in your heads, well, who qualifies as a deviant? And we're going to focus on two forms of deviance here. Positive examples of deviance and negative examples of deviance. But I want you to keep this in mind. That interpretation of what is positive, that interpretation of what is negative, is contingent on who's doing the judging, on who's conducting the interpretation. So think about history. Think about Adolf Hitler, Osama bin Laden, Al Capone. These are individuals that certainly display forms of deviance. We would argue that a vast majority of individuals would label these individuals as negative forms of deviance because of the harm they inflicted on society, because of the terror that they inflicted on society. The idea, is, the idea that these individuals didn't respect humanity. But although the majority of individuals were interpret them as negative forms of deviance, you can also look at the other side of the argument. That to their followers, for Al Capone, to his employees, these, were, these individuals were viewed as positive forms of deviance. Think about when Hitler came to power, a struggling German economy. And in Hitler's messaging, he talked about how if people followed him, if people bought into this fascist Nazi ideology, that they would have a job, that they would have a place to live so they wouldn't freeze in those German winters, that they would be able to feed their children. And what Adolf Hitler did is he scapegoated the Jewish people as an opportunity for Germans that fit his perception of what the ideal man or woman look like. He convinced them to turn a blind eye to the atrocities, to the injustices that he was committing. But to his followers, well, at least we're able to eat. At least we have a safe place to live. So he was seen as a positive form of deviance. He was disrupting the way Politics was operating in Germany at that time. Osama bin Laden. To his followers, he was using a very manipulated, a very, very skewed interpretation of the Quran, of Islam, to justify his actions. 
He exploited key areas to his benefit. His war against the West, his war against individuals who didn't adopt his ideology to his followers was a positive form of deviance. And of course, Al Capone, public enemy number one. To the employees of Al Capone, to the individuals who sought to bite, to purchase alcohol, he was a positive form of deviance because he was going against the Prohibition Act. He was providing a service to individuals who wanted to consume alcohol. So once again, be, even though a majority of people today will view these individuals as negative forms of deviance, we have to understand that judgment is based on who's doing the interpretation. Let's go a step further. Martin Luther King Jr., Coretta Scott King, Dolores Huerta, Robert Kennedy, Cesar Chavez, Gandhi. All these individuals are a form of deviance. They challenged a broken and unjust system through nonviolent protests. But I want you to think about this. Although a majority of people today would view all these individuals on the screen as a positive form of deviance, not everyone did so. To some individuals, these, in, these people on the screen were negative forms of deviance. But they were deviants because they challenged a broken system. They were deviants because every time they were met with aggression and violence and, and the threat of being locked up in jail, they continue with their nonviolent movement. Think about it. The FBI had a file on MLK. They viewed him as one of the most dangerous men in America during the 1950-1960 civil rights movement. But he never fought back. He never promoted violence. But he was viewed as a threat because he was sparking social change. Let's go a step further. I put this mirror because all of us are deviants in some way. And it's not to say that we're breaking laws. But we may be deviants in some way because perhaps we're the first person in our family to graduate from high school. Perhaps we're the first person in our family to enroll in a college. And, we will, and for some of us, we will be the first person in our family to graduate from college. We're breaking a system. That system doesn't necessarily have to be laws on the books. That system could be breaking trends and rewriting a new life script. I want you to think about this. 50, 60 years ago. Not all but a majority of colleges that allowed women to study offered women a handful of majors. And those majors focused typically on education and nursing. Women were limited in what they could study at many institutions. The fact that this class is a majority female is a testament to the progress society has made. And breaking 
those chains, those restrictions of living in a patriarchal society, right? challenging a male dominated society, saying that we're going to rewrite the script of what it means to be a woman in America in 2020, as opposed to what it meant to be a woman in America in 1960. I want to go a step further with this. If anyone recalls the show, I Love Lucy, it was considered abnormal because A, you had a lead actor, a lead actor who was an actress, who was female. And let's go a step further with this. Lucy, yes, she wore dresses, but she also wore pants. See, in the 1950s and the 1960s, a woman wearing pants was considered abnormal behavior. It was seen as masculine. Well, in 2020, I would argue that at least the majority of the females that I've interacted with wear pants. And I personally don't associate that with masculinity. I don't believe a majority of individuals associate that with masculinity. But think about how the profile of a female has changed over the years. Or the profile of what a male is. Or what qualifies as being, in quotations, a man. Qualifies as in today's society. This idea that it was considered abnormal for a father to change a child's diaper, for a father to bathe their child, for a father to show emotion or affection for their child. For a vast majority of human history. And we're rewriting that script today. Fathers are becoming more active in their child's life. You have fathers who are now adopting that role of a stay-at-home parent. Something that we normally didn't see 50, 60, 70 years ago. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with redefining the role of the father within the household or within society. So what are the four major functions of deviance? Well, deviance helps affirm the values and the norms within our society. This idea that we begin to say as a collective whole, what do we value? What behaviors or activities do we consider to be normal? And what behaviors and activities do we consider to be abnormal? We begin to clarify moral boundaries. What is considered morally right? I want you to think about stem cell research. Stem cells can help the body regenerate. It can, they, stem cell research can help individuals recover from injuries or different health-related issues. But in the United States, stem cell research is still controversial. To some groups of individuals, it's considered immoral. So we have laws on the books that in many ways are labeled as moral or immoral behaviors or moral or immoral activities. Think about prostitution. One of the oldest, if not the oldest profession in the world. I teach human sexuality. I have a whole chapter dedicated to prostitution. Prostitution is typically labeled an immoral behavior, an ab 
normal behavior. But on the other hand, it depends on who's doing it. I'm not going to dig too much into prostitution, but there's a hierarchy of prostitution. At the very, very bottom, you have the streetwalker. Right? The individual you might see on Hollywood Boulevard soliciting what we call John's customers. But at the same time, we have at the other end of the spectrum, the call girl, the escorts, individuals who are not soliciting John's on the streets, individuals who make a tremendous amount of money in comparison to street walkers, having high-end clientele. There's a hypocrisy in how escorts, as opposed to streetwalkers, are interpreted. And think about those moral boundaries. The fact that gov the government still restricts people's behaviors as to who they sleep with, whether or not they pay for sex. Then we go a step further with that. Moral and immoral boundaries. The debate as to whether or not a woman has a right to choose. The topic of abortion. Depending on the society that we live in, depending on the times, those moral boundaries may be reclarified at some point. A sense of social unity, this idea that individuals can't get be, can get behind certain values, certain norms to add to a consistency within society. This idea that individuals can't get behind certain rules that go into play for the safety of society. This idea that a majority of individuals will condemn murder. A majority of individuals will condemn drug dealing. And they will get behind policies that support that position. And then the fourth function, an encouragement of social change. The idea that society needs to evolve with the times. Society needs to reflect the diversity of the world. And perhaps provide a more equitable and more equal environment. So let's dig into the topics of functionalism, of conflict theory, of symbolic interactionism. According to functionalist theory in relation to deviance, deviance can help society clarify moral boundaries. In the case of Terry Schiavo, a woman who is kept alive by machines in a hospital. Her husband made the decision that this is not providing her with a quality of life that there was no hope based on medical professions of her ever living again without the dependency of machines, that her life would never be normal in quotations again. And he made that conscious decision to remove the machines, to let her pass away. Well, it turned into a huge lawsuit because her parents didn't agree with that. But as her husband, he had as her husband, he had the right to power of attorney. He had the right to make that decision. You can go a step further with this concept of euthanasia, physician assisted suicide. What if someone has a terminal illness? What if a person's quality of life is threatened to the point where they are no longer responsive or they are no longer able to care for themselves? If an individual is in a tremendous amount of pain and given three months to live, 
does that individual hold that right to request a physician's assistance with plugging, let's say, some type of drug into their system that will end their life sooner than expected? Well, that's up to who's doing the interpretation. Deviance can promote a sense of social cohesion. As we mentioned before, you can bring together a community to face crime and other violations. This idea that if we recall what functionalism is, right, the interdependence components of society that function together for the smooth functioning of society. Well, I want you to think about that. These interdependent components functioning together so society can be cohesive, so society can be consistent, so society can function properly. Well, if we have these moral boundaries, if we have this sense of cohesion, that can contribute to society functioning smoothly, having that consistency. We look at this concept of structural strain theory. And according to sociologist Robert Merton, an individual's position in the social structure will begin to affect his or her experience of deviance and conformity. Think about this, social inequality can create situations in which people experience tension or strain between the goals that society says they should be working toward and the means that they have available to meet those goals. So I want you to think about that. Society tells us, go to college, get a great job, buy a house, save for retirement. Okay, but where's the money to go to college? Am I going to drown in mountains of debt? In my immediate area, are there jobs that pay a livable and comfortable wage where I can save up to buy a house, where I can save up to buy a car, where I can raise a family? Are jobs paying enough? To survive, or do I need to pick up a second or third job? Do I need to work my nine to five, have dinner, rest for an hour, and then drive for Uber or Lyft for a few hours a night just to be able to survive? I want you to think about that. Think about conformity. Conformity is when an individual is able to achieve those approved goals within society through approved means. And we'll define that in a little bit. See, what happens in deviance is that there's a combination of unapproved goals and unapproved means. And we break it down into four different examples. Let's look at the innovator. And the innovator is someone who achieves societal goals through unconventional means. The innovator is someone who thinks outside the box to not only achieve these goals, but to develop solutions, unique solutions. You think about Steve Jobs and the creation of the iPod and the iPhone and the Mac, the Apple computer. You think about Elon Musk and his research and development of purely electric vehicles in the Tesla. Then you look at the ritualist and the ritualist essentially adopts conventional means but they abandon all hope of ever achieving success. 
You could argue that the ritualist is someone, for example, who is in a bad relationship, who is married, but in an awful relationship, but who refuses to get divorced. So they just remain in that relationship, remain in that relationship, remain in the relationship, knowing things will never get better. It's hopeless at that point. That's the ritualist. We look at the retreatist. And the retreatist renounces the culture's goals and means entirely. The retreatist lives outside the conventional norms. The retreatist says, okay, look, I understand society tells me I need to do A, B, and C. And this is how I need to do A, B, and C. But I have no plan to follow those goals or those means. I'm going to write my own life script. I'm going to do it my way. And then think about the rebel. And the rebel is very similar to the retreatist. Because the rebel says, I'm going to reject your cultural definitions of success and how to achieve it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to define what success is to me. So maybe success to me is not purchasing a house with a white picket fence with three kids and two dogs. Maybe success to me is renting, but having the ability to travel or move whenever I want. The rebel is someone who says, you know what, the family unit can be redefined. That we don't necessarily have to subscribe to the family being labeled as or identified as a mother and a father and two or three children. That the family unit could be a husband and husband, a wife and wife, and maybe kids. That a family unit, according to the rebel, can be a mother raising her children, a father raising his children. You reject these cultural definitions of success. You reject these cultural definitions of what is considered acceptable within our society. You're redefining according to the rebel. Then we look at conflict theory. And if you recall, conflict theory, unlike structural functionalism, is this idea that there's, that there's a continuous struggle for limited resources, that there is social inequality within our society where we have the have and have nots, according to Karl Marx, the bourgeoisie, and the proletariat. And in conflict theory, the rules are applied unequally. And the punishment for rule violators is unequally distributed. That those at the very top have a different set of rules and sanctions than those at the bottom. That the behaviors of the least powerful within our society are more likely to be criminalized than the behaviors of the most powerful within our society. Think about it. If you're a celebrity, especially in Los Angeles, you could commit a crime and you're more likely to get a very lenient sentence that someone else who committed a similar crime who will be charged, who may serve an extended period of time in jail or prison. Think about the inequities and inequalities that exist based on socioeconomic status. How much money do you have? See, the least powerful in our society typically don't have the economic means to go and hire a lawyer who in many ways knows how to play the system. Oftentimes the least powerful in our society 
have to rely on public defenders who are balancing 15, 20, 30 cases at once and can't provide their sole focus and energy to only your case. Think about the fact that the norms, the rules, the laws in our society are designed and used to regulate the behaviors of the masses by an elite few. See, what conflict theory says in relation to deviance is that those at the very top, those who are the most powerful, are able to define what is considered normal or abnormal behavior, what is considered acceptable or unacceptable behavior, and then force that ideology onto the least powerful. They do this as a means of social control, as a regulating force, as a regulating behavior. Think about this. Social control, formal and informal mechanisms that are used to elicit conformity to values and norms and promote a sense of social cohesion. At one point, in American society, we had what we called anti-sodomy laws. These laws made it illegal to engage in oral or anal penetration in sexual activity. That applied to both heterosexual and homosexual individuals technically. But the enforcement was unequal. The enforcement was prejudicial. The enforcement of anti-sodomy laws rarely led to the prosecution or to the arrest of heterosexual couples because it was mostly targeted towards the homosexual population. Many of those laws have since been deemed illegal, illegitimate. But think about it. There was this assumption, going back to morality, that homosexuality was wrong. So laws were created to enforce this perspective and ultimately to discriminate against an entire population of individuals. And we'll talk about some of those laws later on when we start to discuss the LGBTQ community. We look at symbolic interactionism. And symbolic interactionism is essentially our focus on interpersonal relationships. How we begin to understand our everyday interactions and how they begin to shape our understanding of deviance. See, when we talk about deviance, as I mentioned before, it's relative to your life experience. It's relative to your interpretation of situations. So what you may consider to be deviant, I may not consider to be deviant, and vice versa. I'm going to give you an example of this. Um, because I teach human sexuality, I have a sponsorship. For my, social, for my human sexuality classes from adamandeve.com. If you've ever seen their infomercials on television late at night, you know that adamandeve.com um, uh, is a sex toy company. So I have a box. They've sent me two very large boxes of sex toys over the years. And I use those in my chapter on, um, on sexual behavior and arousal and things like that. Well, that may be interpreted as a form of deviance because most instructors are not going to bring real life sex toys into the classroom and then turn them on for the world to see. But I would also argue that it's a form of demons to not bring them in 
because then you're depriving students of that opportunity to see in real life what the chapter's covering. That when individuals, I'll typically post a picture on my personal Instagram of, hey, look, I'm doing, getting ready for my lecture on sex toys. And I'll get negative responses to it. How dare you discuss this? How dare you post this picture? Because we've been socialized in our society to be ashamed of sexuality. We've been socialized in our society to interpret sexuality as something that is private, that's something that should not be shared with others. We go through differential association theory as it relates to symbolic interactionism. And differential association theory, according to Sutherland, asserts that we learn to be deviant through our actions with others who break the rules. This idea that individuals who are significant others in our lives might say, don't hang out with bad kids because then you'll become a bad kid. This idea that according to differential association theory, you're influenced by peer pressure. But what we want to understand is that just because you hang out with a bad kid doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be bad yourself. Because we need to then gauge, well, what value does this relationship hold? How much influence does this person have on your everyday life that they can influence you to engage in negative or bad behaviors? And so you want to take that into consideration. The idea of why do we engage in deviant behaviors? There was a belief held prior to about the 1970s by the FBI that people were innately bad. In other words, that people were born as deviants, as rule breakers, as criminals. But what we started to find post-1970s, when the FBI started to focus more on social and behavioral sciences, is that there were life experiences that influenced a person's behavior. There are life experiences, things that occurred that pushed an individual to engage in deviant and or criminal acts. That acts of deviance were learned based on a variety of life experiences. If any of you are interested and you have a subscription to Netflix, I would highly, highly recommend watching the show Mind Hunters. Because Mind Hunters focuses on the development of the social behavioral science division within the FBI. And it's a very fascinating, fascinating show. Then we look at la labeling theory. And labeling theory essentially proposes that deviance is not inherent in any act or belief or condition, but rather through labeling theory, an act or belief or condition is labeled as deviance based on the social context, based on people's response to the behavior. So just because I engage in behavior A, B, and C doesn't make it deviant until others or until the social context labels it a deviant act. Think about this. The situation, the social context is shooting a home intruder as opposed to shooting a store clerk during a robbery. Two different contexts. Shooting a home intruder, depending on what state you live in, will not typically be labeled a deviant act. But going to a store and trying to rob it across the board for the most part is going to be labeled 
a deviant act. As we mentioned before, labels vary depending on the culture, depending on the time period, depending on the situation. And when we look at labeling theory, it focuses intensely on how individuals think of themselves. Once a deviant label has been applied to them, this looking glass self, how do I begin to interpret who I am? When individuals label me a deviant, a bad kid, whatever it may be, how does that begin to shape my sense of self, my self-confidence? And so we look at it from the perspective of what we call primary deviance, secondary deviance, and tertiary deviance. And primary deviance is the initial act or the attitude that causes one to be labeled a deviance. You walk into a store when you're a teenager, you decide to steal, you know, whatever it is you decide to steal, maybe it's a, a screen for your new phone you get caught. People begin to view you as a deviant, as a thief. That's the primary act. Secondary deviance is the subsequent deviant identity or career that develops as a result of becoming being labeled deviant. So what does that mean? Well, essentially, the primary act was stealing the cell phone cover. You get caught. And then you decide, you know what? Everyone views me as a criminal. Everyone views me as a delinquent or a deviant. I'm just going to run with this. And instead of learning from the act of getting caught stealing the cell phone cover or whatever it may be, you decide, I'm going to become a criminal. I'm just going to engage in deviant acts because that's what everyone expects of me. And then tertiary deviance is essentially you redefine the stigma associated with the deviant label and you turn that into a positive phenomenon. You run with it. Uh, prior to teaching, I worked in the music industry and um, I did a lot of artist developments. And many of the individuals that I worked with um, are, are pretty big names in the industry nowadays. And what's interesting is that a couple of those individuals were former drug dealers or you know, participating in gang activities, whatever it may be. Activities that would typically label them as deviant, but that were essential to building their music careers as hip hop artists. See, they took a negative experience or an experience that most people would deem negative they turned it into music, which sold these fantasies for suburban America of what it was like to be in a gang, what it was like to grow up in a, neighbor, a certain neighborhood, what it was like to sell drugs, whatever violence, whatever it may be. And they made millions of dollars. And not only providing for the, for the lives of their families, but also then creating opportunities for other people in their community to come up. So you take this negative stigma of being a, a gang member or being a drug dealer, whatever it may be, and you turn it into something positive. That's tertiary deviance. We look at a self-fulfilling prophecy, an inaccurate statement or belief that by altering, altering the situation becomes accurate. A prediction that causes itself to become true. This idea that someone tells you you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, or you're dumb, you're dumb, you're dumb, you're dumb, you're dumb. And you say, okay, I guess this is going to become my reality. I am bad. I am dumb. And that begins to influence your sense of self and the behaviors that you engage in. You look at stereotype threat. And stereotype threats a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in which the fear of performing poorly and confirming stereotypes 
about a particular social group may cause, for example, a student to perform poorly. Let me give you an example of this. I've done a lot of research on this related to science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Believe it or not, in many four-year universities, particularly in the majors of like aerospace engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, there is relatively low participation of females within these engineering fields or majors at a college or university campus. So a female student goes to, let's say, um, the University of Washington, and you are a mechanical engineering major. And you walk into this huge auditorium for whatever engineering class you're taking. There's 300 students in that class. You walk in and you are one of two females in the entire class. The professor, the teacher's assistants break you up into groups and they assign the duties to you. Well, stereotype threats as you develop this sense of anxiety, this sense of paranoia and worry. So you're in charge of doing all the mathematical equations. Well, think about how our society is socialized. Boys are supposed to be good at math and science. Girls are supposed to be good at reading and writing. That's not based on any evidence. That's based on a stereotype. So you go into these groups and you find that your male counterparts or your, your colleagues, I should say, are second guessing your mathematical equations are double checking your mathematical equations because they don't have faith that you know what you're doing, even though you have more math experience and better grades than they did in high school. You grow so concerned with messing up that it ruins your experience, that you're constantly paranoid that if I mess up these equations, my classmates, my colleagues will not attribute it to a silly mistake. They will attribute it to sexist ideology. That the reason I messed up on this project was because I was a female. And think about how heavy a burden that is for an individual to constantly carry that worry, that anxiety, that somehow they're going to be judged based on their race or ethnicity, their gender, as opposed to just a silly mistake that was made. Then we look at stereotype promise. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in which positive stereotypes, such as the model minority label, is applied to particular groups, in particular, let's say, Asian Americans, that lead to positive performance outcomes for Asian Americans. Well, what I tell my students is that if you're going to accept the positive stereotypes, then you also have to be willing to accept negative stereotypes. But the lesson at hand is to not accept any stereotypes. Because stereotypes provide unrealistic expectations. Stereotypes further promote inequity and inequality. Stereotypes are oversimplified perceptions of groups that are inaccurate. And so we want to keep that in mind. Think about the effects of deviant labels, of labeling individuals a particular way, and how unhealthy that is how that can shape social and institutional policies, how that can shape a person's self-image, how that can shape how we treat others. Getting rid of stereotypes is step number one. And starting to challenge labeling theory. Now, 
Robert Kennedy, as he was running for president of the United States before his assassination, gave this speech titled, The Mindless Menace of Violence in America. And I encourage you, if you have the opportunity to listen to that speech on YouTube, much of what he was saying is relevant to what we're witnessing in society today. Now, I pulled this particular, these particular words from that speech because I thought they were incredibly relevant today. Let's read this together. When you teach a man to hate and fear his brother, when you teach that he is a lesser man because of his color or his beliefs or the policies he pursues, when you teach that those who differ from you threaten your freedom or your job or your home, then you also learn to confront others, not as fellow citizens, but as enemies. Think about what is happening and has been happening throughout American society and throughout American history. The idea that there are segments of our population who have been socialized to buy into racist, prejudicial, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, etc., etc., rhetoric and a mindset. And that how that begins to cloud and limit our progress as a society. Let's look at racism. The picture on the left is from the late 1800s, the Chinese Exclusionary Act. If anyone recalls that from your history classes in high school. The Chinese Exclusionary Act made it appear as if the Chinese immigrants that were coming to America were somehow going to take over America. They were gonna take over American culture and they were going to turn America into an extension of China. We hear that same rhetoric today. If you recall from the Charlottesville documentary on vice. They brought up culture. Anytime you study white supremacist ideology, they oftentimes warn of this culture war, this culture clash that immigrants are changing the fabric of America, that threatening American culture, which is absurd because American culture is a collection of multiple cultures. It's a collection of people from all across the world. It's a collection of multiple languages. How about this? 1929, El Paso, Texas, one of my favorite cities in the United States today, but I would definitely have not been welcomed in El Paso in 1929 because signs like this were on buildings. No dogs, no Negroes, no Mexicans. If you've ever been in El Paso, Texas, you know it's right on the Mexican border. If you're on the University of Texas El Paso campus and you have a very strong arm, you can throw a baseball into Mexico. That is how close it is. How about this? Help wanted. No Irish need apply. The Irish immigrants were largely discriminated against in the early 20th century. They are viewed once again as stealing our jobs, jeopardizing the culture of America. They were portrayed as drunks. They were portrayed as corrupt. I want you to understand something, and I'll share this again when we talk about race and ethnicity. The bigoted, racist, prejudicial rhetoric that has been used to discriminate against one group and then another 
is the same rhetoric that's been recycled generation after generation after generation. They just apply it to a different group. It's infuriating to me. The great injustice is committed by our K-12 education system. Because our K-12 education system, in particular as it relates to the teaching of history, gives you a very watered-down version of history. They mention slavery for half a page. They mention the Chinese Exclusionary Act for a quarter of a page, maybe less. They talk about Native Americans and the re-socialization of Native Americans as something that was welcomed, but they don't tell you the truth. The Native American children were sent to these boarding schools where they were beaten, where they were starved and forced to assimilate into an American culture that did not welcome them. So it's basically talk like an American, whatever that means, dress like an American, whatever that means, but you will never be fully accepted as an American. We don't talk about the ugly history of America because it makes us uncomfortable. But how are we supposed to learn from the mistakes if we choose to ignore them? What we want to understand, and we'll talk about this more when we talk about race and ethnicity, is that the history of America that is taught in our history books is not the history of ethnic and racial minorities in America. It is not the history of women. It is not the history of the LGBTQ community. It is not the history of the poor and those forgotten populations. I want you to think about that. Let's talk about the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. Sit-ins. Imagine being 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. Going to lunch counters. Sitting in these lunch counters that are segregated. Colored section, whites only. As an African-American as a white ally, joining your African-American brothers and sisters at these lunch counters in the whites only section. You're told to go back to the section that is for colored people. You sit there, a mob, a group of individuals grows upset that you're sitting in the whites only section as an African-American, they throw salt into your eyes. They spill coffee over your head and onto your lap. They beat you. They bombard you with racial insults, racist insults. They engage in this level of violence and the whole entire time. You sit there peacefully and you take it. You do not respond. How many of us would have that level of restraint. And then when the police finally showed up, they didn't arrest the aggressors. They didn't arrest the abusers. They arrested you because you broke the law, the Jim Crow era laws. Think about being a middle school or high school student. And you're on the streets protesting and fighting for justice and equality. The fire department shows up and they turn their water hoses on you. If anyone's ever seen a, a fire hose from a fire department turned on, you know it's significantly different than the water hose you may use in your front or backyard. Think about the pressure. Think about the pain. The fact that it has enough pressure to push you to the ground. Think about how dogs were used as a form of violence and intimidation. 
to individuals during the civil rights era and even to today. And I want you to look at the picture on the right hand side. The picture on the right hand side is one of the most iconic images from the civil rights era. This individual just passed away a few days ago. His name is John Lewis. John Lewis, at, I believe the age of 23, maybe even younger than that, marched with Martin Luther King. He was one of the leaders of the civil rights movement. He participated in the Freedom Rides where he was beaten and arrested on multiple occasions. This is John Lewis, who in this picture was beaten with a baton and hit in the head multiple times that led him to be hospitalized. so that we can achieve, he made these sacrifices so that we could achieve a greater sense of equality, civil rights for future generations. This is also the individual that our president said, Donald Trump, that he was all talk and no action. Understand that Trump and John Lewis are, John Lewis passed away at 80 years old. Trump's only a few years younger than him. When Trump was living his privileged life as a young man, going to prep schools and then going to an Ivy League institution and enjoying his white privilege, John Lewis was traveling through the South signing a will at the age of 22, 23 years old, going on these freedom rides, getting beaten and arrested in the struggle for civil rights. He was a man of few words, but of great action. And so I want you to take that into consideration when we look at this. Look at this image, the great fear of the period that Uncle Sam may be swallowed by foreigners. On the right-hand side, this was in newspapers, supposed to depict a Chinese individual. On the left-hand side, supposed to depict an Irish individual eating Uncle Sam, that immigrants are jeopardizing America. That was the common fear. But let's relate it to today. Return to sender, stop illegal immigration. The 14th Amendment and the, civil, and the civil rights was for blacks, not illegals. Save, save, save American jobs, deport all illegal aliens. See, we forget about the humanity aspect. I've done studies before where I looked at individuals who held very prejudicial beliefs who tried to justify children being separated from their parents at the border as a means to dissuade individuals from coming to the United States. And I want you to take this into consideration that those children who are being separated at the border did not cross that border illegally. Those children who are being separated at the border today and separated from their parents and going through the psychological torture, those parents and those children were seeking asylum in the United States. They surrendered themselves at a port of entry, trusted that the American system, the American government would treat them right, it give them a fair opportunity. And instead, because our government didn't want them here or don't want them here, 
He said, well, if we take away your children, maybe that will keep other people from coming. And now what we're learning is that our government didn't keep track of many of these families. We don't know who the children belong to. That is a deviant act. In my personal opinion, that is an evil act. But I go back to my studies and you find that many people who try to justify the separation of children, they'll say, oh, Obama did. Well, let's keep it real. Obama kept families together and I don't like the cages. And he did have those cages, but he kept families together. That was not right either. Well, Obama had children. No, no, no. The children that were, that were in these cages, once again, I condemn the use of these cages. Those children were unaccompanied minors, meaning that they were not intentionally separated from their parents. They came to a port of entry. They came to the border alone. But you see how many of these individuals are profiles. God-fearing, Christian, you know, whatever it may be. And I look at myself and I said, well, we must subscribe to a different Christian doctrine then. Because how do you treat individuals and, like this and strip them of their humanity? How do you treat people as the other? See, what these individuals have done is they developed a very ethnocentric perspective of the world. My life is better than yours. My culture is superior to yours. And I want you to think about this. And we're going to talk about this more when we talk about race and ethnicity. For those of us who have had the privilege of enjoying American citizenship our entire lives, what do we have to do to gain that citizenship? Not a damn thing other than be born. And then we see this assault, this playing of the lives of DACA recipients and dreamers. We see the recent attempt on international students, if they weren't able to have face-to-face -face instruction, that they would have to go home. What is America's fear of immigrants? Because immigrants are woven into the fabric of America. Immigrants have shaped the identity of America. So you want to take that into consideration when we, as we go through this. Think about this fear of Islam. In my opinion, people talk out of their ass when they start to talk about Islam, yet know nothing about Islam. I hear these TV pundits, right, going, Sharia law, Sharia law, a jihad, without even knowing what that is. You have individuals making stupid statements like Muslims are terrorists. Uh, no. Some individuals who may identify as Muslim, who have adopted a very skewed reality of what Islam is, may identify as terrorists the same way an individual who goes to shoot up um, a clinic that happens to do abortions can be labeled a terrorist, a domestic terrorist, who happens to be Christian. We want to take that into consideration that we pick and choose who we want to call terrorists, that we pick and choose who we want to label as a bad religion without knowing anything about it. We read, we look at this saying, a Muslim free America. We see these signs, say no to Syrian refugees. No Allah in America. Well, Allah is God. So no God in America? I mean, think about how stupid this is. Allah is just another way of saying God. And this person is saying, no God in America, yet they want a Christian God to be followed. I want you to think about this, this level of 
deafening ignorance. Let's look at this. Hate crimes since 2016 have increased against Muslims by 60 to 70 percent. 49 percent of Americans believe that some Muslims are anti-American. 11 percent of Americans believe that all Muslims are anti-American. 46 percent of Americans believe that Islam is the most violent religion. Well, clearly they haven't studied Christianity and understood the history of Christianity. We're not here to compare apples and oranges or apples and apples. I'm not here to say that one religion is better than another. I'm here to say that before you cast the first stone, you might want to check your religion too, your faith too. But I want you to think about this. This idea that there are Americans that believe that in the Quran, there is anti-American rhetoric, when in reality, the Quran was written many, 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 many years before America was even a concept. And to believe that a group of individuals is anti-American is absurd. Is there a small segment of the world population that may not like what America stands for? Certainly. But that's not exclusive to Islam. That occurs in our country as well with individuals who were born in this country and who identify with a variety of faiths. Let's talk about Sharia law. If anyone remembers hearing about Sharia law, you have people saying, Dearborn, Michigan, North Carolina is being overrun with Muslims and they're going to engage in Sharia law. Well, Sharia law in its purest form, not the manipulated version, but in its purest form, is a path to be followed. It's influenced by two key factors, the Quran and Sana. These are ethical and moral guidelines for how we practice one's faith, similar to, in Christianity, the Ten Commandments, thou shall not. It has nothing to do with oppressing individuals. It has nothing to do with violence. When we look at Sharia law in its purest form, not the manipulated form, see the media, individuals with these ulterior motives, they focus on the manipulated version of a few as opposed to what the words are really saying. These guidelines for ethical and moral lives we hear the term jihad, a holy war. They're launching a jihad against America. Well, that's not what a jihad is. It's survival. It's struggle. A jihad is that struggle within oneself to maintain self-control, to focus on betterment, improving oneself. We see that in Christianity as well. This idea of how do you become a better person? How do you subscribe to the doctrine? How do you live a good moral life? And at times, we are going to have this internal struggle, this internal jihad, this internal war within ourselves, where we want to do A, B, and C, but our faith tells us you have to do X, Y, and Z. I'm going to warn you. The photos that we're going to see next are very intense. These are not staged photos. These are from the chemical attack that Assad launched on his people in Syria. Many of the victims were children. 70% of the refugees, 70%, maybe more than that, from Syria looking for a place to live in Europe, in the United States, our children. If people fear, well, are those terrorists? Well, I, I'm not afraid of a five-year-old. I'm not afraid of a seven-year-old. That's the ignorance of some Europeans. That's the ignorance of some Americans that assume a child's going to be a terrorist. And so we allow these children to remain in dangerous conditions. So let's go through this. The young boy on the right-hand side, 
went through a traumatic experience in Syria. Think about how that's going to shape his life. These children, the images here, they're not asleep. They're dead. These were not images widely shared on social media. These were not images widely shared in newspapers or news media in general. Look at the pain. Look at the death. This is what happens when we treat people as if they're the other. This is what happens when we dehumanize populations and we turn a blind eye to the atrocities that are taking place throughout the world. Let's look at hate crimes against the LGBT community over the last four years. We've seen an increase of almost 25% in hate crimes against the, the, the LGBTQ community. We look at these images. The image to the left is from the Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas. Their web website is godhatesfags.com. They show up to military funerals. They show up to concerts. They show up to a wide, wide variety of events. And they hold these signs. They have children holding these signs up. They believe that homosexuality is like the worst thing to ever hit America. There's obsession with discriminating against the LGBT community is sickening. Look at this image on the right-hand side. Homosexual marriage is an act of terrorism. Really? An act of terrorism? Homosexuals are possessed by demons. What people don't understand is when these images appear, when these words are spoken, these are not exclusive to individuals on the streets marching. You may even hear these words in your own household. Think about the number of teenage or young people suicides that occur on an annual basis. As a result of that child identifying as homosexual and being so terrified to tell their family members because their family members are homophobic. Think about how tough that can be, that coming out process. I worked at an all-male high school. And I had a number of students come out to me and they told me, hey, I'm gay, because they knew that I was supportive of the LGBT community. They know that I, they knew that I was, or I am, I should say, an ally. As a heterosexual male, I support the LGBT community. Students have asked me before, what if your son was gay or is gay? Would that change anything? I said, not at all. I would love him the same way, you know, five, six years from now, if he came out, that I do today, even more. Why well, you want to think about that? Because not every child has that opportunity to be themselves. There are so many individuals from the high school students that I've interacted with over the years, even some of my college students who have told me, I can't come out to my family because my family doesn't agree with homosexuality. Well, they may not agree with homosexuality, but guess what? Gays are here to stay. But you also hear by these homophobic individuals that gay culture is taking over America. Really? Because the gay population is estimated to be anywhere between 2 to 10% of the American population, which means that anywhere from 90 to 98% of the American population is still heterosexual. You hear individuals, we're going to talk about this when we talk about the LGBT community later on, that being gay is a choice. 
well, being gay is a choice, then being heterosexual is a choice. So I look at those homophobic individuals and I ask them, so at what point in your life did you decide to be heterosexual? When did you flip that switch and say, you know what, I think I'm going to be like a member of the opposite sex as opposed to a member of the same sex? We want to think about this as we go through this in, into our future discussions. We can argue that poverty is deviant, that 15 million children in the United States live in poverty, that 43% of American children live in low-income houses. We know that poverty impedes a child's ability to learn. We know that poverty contributes to poor health and well-being. That if persistent, poverty can lead to poor mental health because people don't have access to the resources that they so desperately need. We have a tendency in America to blame people for being poor not realizing that there are social institutions, there are social policies that limit the social upward mobility of individuals in particular communities. We want to take that into consideration as we go through this because the impact of poverty is real. The impact of poverty affects our education system. The fact that there are children in our society today who their only two meals that they'll eat today will be the breakfast and the lunch that they're going to receive from their school. Yet you have people who are opposed to those programs because they've never had to look at those students. They've never had to interact with those students. They've never had to worry about where their next meal's coming from. There's that disconnect in many ways. Look at this image. By age four, poor children have heard 30 million fewer words than well-off children. Poor children are more likely to be hungry and less likely to have access to affordable, quality health care. That's the key part, quality. Because it could be affordable, but it may not be quality. It could be accessible, but it may not be quality. Health care. Poor children are less likely to graduate from high school. Child poverty increases with the risk of, the risk of unemployment, the risk of adult poverty. It's an endless cycle. Let's look at this map. Nearly 25% of U.S. children live in poverty. Well, let's go a step further with this. Let's look at poverty, child poverty, children living in low-income situations. So we're, calling, we're including poverty and low-income. By state, 55% of the children in California are low-income and or living in poverty. Texas, 60%. Mississippi, 71%. Louisiana, 65%. West Virginia, 52 Kentucky, 55 Look at this map. Look at New York, 48%. This hinders a person's progress. This creates barriers. It's not to say that people can't overcome barriers. People can certainly overcome barriers. It's just that they have to work two or three or four times harder. And for some individuals, they just give up. Let's look at abuse toward women. And we'll talk about this more when we talk about sexual coercion and when we talk about gender. In the United States, an estimated 1.3 million women are raped every year. A vast majority of these rapes will never go reported. And we'll dig into that more later on when we talk about sexual coercion. Two women are raped every minute in the United States. 31% of women have reported being physically abused by an intimate partner, right? Domestic violence. I want you to look at this statistic. One in five women in college have been sexually assaulted. 
and our colleges and the US military have done a horrible job at protecting the humanity, protecting the rights of women within their ranks, with, it, with women as students at their, at their institutions. They've done an awful job, and we're going to discuss that later on. Let's look at this. 15 out of 16 rapists who see no time in jail for their actions. You have individuals like Ben Shapiro and all these other idiots who have these podcasts and radio shows saying there's no such thing as rape culture. They're talking out of their ass. We do have an issue with rape in our society. We do have an issue with abuse towards women in our society. It is ingrained in American culture and we've had a tolerance for it for too long. Your generation, my generation, we're doing things to change that. The Me Too movement is changing that narrative and bringing about change, positive change. How about these words? Sadly, the overwhelming amount of violent crime in our major cities is committed by Blacks and Hispanics. That is false, but that is a narrative that is promoted. They're sending people that have lots of problems. They're bringing those problems. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists and some I assume are good people. 26,000 unreported sexual assaults in the military. Only 238 convictions. What did these geniuses expect when they put men and women together? Well, I'm guessing they probably assumed that the men in the military would be able to control themselves. I'm assuming that they thought, you know, women would be viewed as equals and as human beings, not property. And then we hear locker room talk, grab them by the pussy. If you haven't figured it out by now, these are all words spoken by our now president of the United States. These were not words spoken when he was a dumb, you know, uh, a kid who didn't know anything better. These were not words spoken by a young man who still needed to learn about the world. These were words spoken by someone who at this time was in his late, in his late sixties, early seventies. You'd hope by then he'd know that these were unacceptable comments. Then we look at this concept of stigma and deviant identity. And stigmas are outward indications that there's something shameful about being the bearer. They carry with them some level of disgrace, some level of failing. And these stigmatized identities carry at times social consequences. You go from being a member of the in-group or never being a member of the in-group to always holding this position of being an outsider, a member of the out-group. This idea that you're being excluded from normal social interaction. And what we want to understand is that stigmatized identities are specific to whatever norms and prejudices that a particular group, a particular society, a particular time period is promoting. You may have three of the most common forms of stigma, physical or mental impairments. Having some type of disability may be a stigma, depending on who's doing the interpretation. Moral stigmas, signs of flawed character. Individuals of adult, who are adulterers, right, who, who, who cheat on their significant others, who are unfaithful, they may hold that stigma among a close group of friends or among with their social circles. And then a tribal stigma, right, membership in a discredited or an oppressed group that can limit life opportunities. So that will conclude our discussion for the deviance chapter.